I've proposed by Senator McConnell. As most people are painfully aware, we just came through a 35-day government shutdown. Uh, it didn't work for anybody. I'm here today to talk about a very simple way to keep these shutdowns from happening in the future. And I'm also here to talk a little about how it fits into the broader discussion that we're having. Uh, what I'm not suggesting is that we somehow leave the border security issue aside. It's a very important issue. We have to address it. The president has presented a reasonable plan. His plan is actually to rely on the experts to determine what kind of barriers ought to be along the border. Uh, his fund, uh, uh, funding of $5.7 billion that he talks about for these barriers is exactly to fund the top 10 priorities of what the experts are saying, which is the Customs and Border Protection Border Security Improvement Plan. So I think that makes sense, along with many other things. Um, you know, a structure alone, a barrier alone is not enough. You have to have cameras. You have to have ways to see who's coming, and, and you have to have ways to respond to it, more Border Patrol. You have to have more technology. Uh, he also has more drones in his proposal. He has screening at the ports of entry to be able to stop some of these drugs from coming into our communities, the cocaine, the crystal meth, the heroin, most of which is coming from Mexico. So I think it's a good plan, and I think we should provide him help on this plan because we have a true crisis at the border, no matter how you measure it, whether it's in terms of the drugs or in terms of people coming over or if it's in terms of the human trafficking that's occurring, according to the experts. But let's do it the right way. Let's do it through experts. Let's not do it because the politicians say it's the right thing to do. Let's do it because the experts on the border say it is, and let's put the right kind of barriers in the right kind of place. Uh, that's what I see in the president's plan. Uh, he also is talking about working with Democrats on some immigration priorities they've had over the years. For the last 10 years, there are Democrats who have talked about these young people who came here as children through no fault of their own. The president has said he'd like to give them more certainty as part of this plan. Let's take him up on that. Why would we miss this opportunity? It's a good idea. It's the right thing from a policy perspective. And by providing that kind of help to those DACA recipients, those now young people who are working, who are in school, who run our military, uh, I think we can actually also get some Democrats to be helpful to provide more border security. At the same time, we're helping those who are here who are deserving of that help. The president has also proposed to help people who come from 10 different countries around the world to be able to ensure that they can stay here with some certainty for another few years. These are people who are in the so-called TPS program, a temporary protected status program. 10 countries where there is war, there is famine, there is uh, natural disaster, there are issues where you don't want to send those people back. They're working. Um, and the work authorization is what this is about. And a lot of employers here are, are eager to have them stay to be able to continue to work for some period of time. So some certainty for those individuals, tens of thousands of whom live in some states where there are two Democrat senators, states like Maryland or states like Virginia, where those senators have been stalwarts, have been advocates for being sure that there's some more certainty for these individuals. So it seems to me we have a good combination here. Let's get it done. The conferees are talking right now. But in the meantime, <laughs> let's not go back to a government shutdown. Uh, it's not going to help us get to a solution. In fact, I would argue it's not only not leverage on, the behalf, uh, on behalf of the president or any of us, it actually works the other way. Because when you have the government shut down, everybody loses. I'm hearing from senators on both sides of the aisle that they're fed up with these shutdowns. There's now a building bipartisan consensus that we need to end government shutdowns. I'm encouraged because I'm also hearing from around the country about this. There's a bipartisan consensus among individuals about it. Interesting poll out today that'll give you a sense of this. People were given three options. What if these talks break down, they were asked. Should we do one of three things? Should we shut down the government again? Should we turn to a national emergency that the president's been talking about as a possible option? Or should we not do either of those first two, but rather do the default, which is to have a continuing resolution, the spending from last year continue? Guess what? Only 9% of those polled wanted another government shutdown. 91% said, no, let's not go back there. I call that a consensus. So I think it's time for us to take action here in the United States Congress to say, 
Let's stop this. And by the way, people feel this way because they get it. They know that these shutdowns are a hardship for federal employees who are furloughed or forced to go to work without being paid. Uh, it's a hardship for small businesses that couldn't get government work paid for, work that they had done. It's a hardship to taxpayers who want good taxpayer services, like having a national park open or having food inspections or having their IRS hotline that we pay for as taxpayers open. Of course, I heard from a lot of constituents in Ohio during the last 35 days. I heard from a TSA, TSA officer in Cincinnati who, like most people I represent, lives paycheck to paycheck. And he told me he could not sleep at night. Why? Because he'd never missed a mortgage payment. And he had to miss one because he'd lost two paychecks. I heard about a butcher shop. I actually went to visit it in Cleveland, Ohio. It's a new butcher shop just opening. It's got an interesting mission. It's a, it's a deli and butcher shop in a low-income neighborhood. And they want to provide fresh, relatively inexpensive, but quality, healthy food for this neighborhood. It's needed. It's one of these areas where you heard these, the food desert, where in some areas, particularly in our inner cities, sometimes there's just not good, healthy food anywhere. Well, this little butcher shop was excited about offering it. But guess what? Because of the shutdown, they couldn't get the required federal permission to be able to accept food stamps. So they had their opening, and everything was great, but they couldn't complete their mission. Their mission was to help these people be able to have better food. I heard from others as well. I heard from our federal prosecutors in Ohio. I do a lot of work in trying to push back against the opioid issue, the heroin, the fentanyl, the fact that we have these drug rings in Ohio and elsewhere that are causing so much harm. These prosecutors said they couldn't pursue those cases. One said, you know, we can't pay informants during the shutdown. Think about that. So we're slowing down our prosecution of human trafficking, of opioids, of rape, of so many horrible issues that we want to address. Can't do it during a shutdown as effectively because, again, the funds aren't there to pursue these investigations. I heard from Ohio Craft Beer Breweries. Now, these are small businesses in Ohio. Uh, I'm told there are about 65 new ones in the last couple years in Ohio. It's a big deal, probably in your state too. These are great businesses. Uh, they have not been able to expand over the last several weeks during this 35-day shutdown or to introduce new products, which is absolutely essential to their revenue stream. You know, they come out every season with a new product to be able to continue to get folks to drink these craft beers, but they needed a permit from the federal government to do that, so they couldn't introduce any new products. By the way, I talked to uh, one of them today, and they told me they still because we've been trying to help them, they still can't get the necessary federal permits and licenses to be able to do this. Why? Because the federal government office is so backed up because of the shutdown. So here we are almost a week after the shutdown, but really still in shutdown for the purposes of these small businesses. And I've heard from the young men and women of the United States Coast Guard, because in Ohio, we have Lake Erie, we have Coast Guard stations, and we have a lot of great patriots uh, who have been struggling financially as they worked for no pay. But by the way, they were determined to do their duty. And I applaud their, patri their patriotism. And I applaud the patriotism of all the federal workers who showed up without getting paid and did their duty and were proud to do their duty. A lot of these folks missed two paychecks, but they didn't miss a beat, and we appreciate them. So in addition to the impact the shutdown has had on those federal employers, those employees and their families, it's also had a real impact on our economy, and we should pay attention to that. The Congressional Budget Office just released a report on Monday estimating the economic impacts that the shutdown had on our economy. And remember, this was just a partial shutdown. Most of the funding for defense, as an example, we had appropriated, but 25 percent we had not. But this is what happened. When paychecks didn't flow into the economy, when furloughed federal workers can't perform needed services but are paid after the fact anyway, and when there are sudden disruptions for federal contractors and other businesses that rely on timely payment from these agencies, it has a real impact. And taxpayers are worse off. CBO estimated the partial shutdown reduced GDP by $11 billion in the near term, $8 billion in the first quarter of this year, $3 billion in the fourth quarter of 2018. Fortunately, the agency expects an offsetting increase in economic activity now the government has reopened and federal employees are receiving back pay. But over the long term, CBO estimates that $3 billion will never be recovered in our economy. So it even has an economic impact for all of us. And that goes to jobs and wages, economic growth. 
so some of that lost economic impact of course also means less revenue is it significant in terms of the overall revenue for government some would say no but it is less tax revenue to the federal government for example the aviation industry was hit particularly hard by the shutdown the f a a was subject to the shutdown and many of my constituents expressed concerns about aviation safety we heard about the long delays at some of the airports that has economic impact i would tell you airlines such as delta airlines uh, southwest airlines reported they have lost tens of millions of dollars in revenue in january so this is over and above the cbo estimate i was talking about delta about twenty five million dollars southwest between ten and fifteen million dollars these lost earnings have decreased federal tax revenues of course to the government so CBO didn't put a price on that, but in fact, it's even worse than CBO estimates because of the budgetary impacts that lead to some of these revenue impacts as well. Bottom line is that the lower economic growth and the disruptions for federal employees ultimately cost taxpayers more than if Congress had just passed these appropriations bills on time and we hadn't gotten into the shutdown. It doesn't have to be this way. And again, that's why I'm working to ensure we don't go there again. In every Congress, uh, for the last five Congresses since I was elected, in 2010, I've introduced legislation called the End Government Shutdowns Act. I was involved with this when I was on the House side and in government uh, for President Bush, and now I'm involved with it here because I just think these shutdowns make no sense. I've introduced it under Republican and Democratic presidents. I've introduced it under Republican and Democratic control of the House and the Senate. So this is not a political issue to me. Uh, this is a good government issue. The bill is very simple, common sense steps that would continue funding from the previous year for any appropriation bill that's not done, and when there's a uh, continuing resolution, as there is now, whenever that continuing resolution expires, you just continue the funding from the previous year. Some have called that an auto CR. But instead of shutting down, you know, government at least continues to operate. A CR is not the ultimate answer. What we really want to do is to get this place, get Congress to actually do its work and to pass the individual appropriations bills. That's how you reform government. That's how you ensure there's some certainty and predictability, particularly at the Department of Defense, where they worry a lot about that. So my bill also says that after the first 120 days, four months, there is a 1% across the board reduction in spending to get people to the table, you know, so that appropriators who like to spend money actually have some incentive to not just continue the CR. I think that's important. We then reduce it by 1% every 90 days thereafter if Congress doesn't get its act together and put these bills together. So I think this will help, not just to stop shutdowns, but also to keep us from having perpetual continuing resolutions. Only through passing these individual bills can we do our constitutional duty, and it is our duty. By the way, some Democrats have said they're not wild about the 1% cut across the board after four months. Uh, and they have said somehow Republicans would like that better than us. I just don't agree with that. <laughs> I will tell you, 54% of the spending in this category is defense spending. Not security spending, which is more than that, but 54% of it, more than half, is defense spending. It is Republicans on this side of the aisle who talk every year and have accomplished, we have accomplished increasing defense spending. We're not going to want to cut defense spending. By the same token, some on the other side will feel strongly about their priorities. And some of us have other priorities as well. We all have priorities. This is not meant to be an uneven balance. It's meant to be fair, 1% across the board for everything. So my hope is that we can pass this legislation. We've now got 28 co-sponsors in the United States Senate. More than half of the Republicans are on this bill. Uh, we have the opportunity to actually move this forward, I hope, in this current negotiation over the border I talked about and over the immigration policies I talked about. Let's do it. The other side of the Capitol, my friend Troy Balderson, a Republican representative from Ohio, and a Democrat, Jeff Van Drew from New Jersey, have introduced this bill. They introduced it last week, so now we have a companion bill that is bipartisan in the House as well. You've heard Speaker Pelosi say she's against shutdowns. You've heard Chuck Schumer, who's the leader over here for the Democrats, say he's against shutdowns. You've heard a lot of our leadership say they're against shutdowns. Well, this might be something we can actually get together on and do something about. So my hope is that we can move forward. We hope that we can put a common sense bill in place that doesn't allow us to fall back into another one of these painful government shutdowns. It's not good for anybody. Let's do forge a bipartisan agreement on this funding. We're not that far apart, as I said earlier. Let's be sure we have border security. Let's deal with some of these lingering immigration issues where the president has extended the olive branch. Let's do something good 
for the people we represent. But at the same time, let's find the will to include in this package legislation that ends these government shutdowns. While it is still fresh in our minds as to what happened these last several weeks, let's be sure that having gone through this bitter experience of the longest shutdown in history, we don't let people down. Instead, we make sure that we do not let this moment pass and indeed stop these government shutdowns once and for all. I yield back my time. Tomorrow, we get a preview of the Trump administration's 2020 defense budget request. Hosted by the Center for Strategic and International Studies, our live coverage begins at 1.30.